Hi, I'm Dr. Raj, and I'm so excited to present my new volume in our book series published by Elsevier. Of course, the series is Morning Report, Beyond the Pearls, and this volume is Obstetrics and Gynecology. I am so proud of this book. So, where should we talk about today? What should we talk about? You know what? Speaking to some of my colleagues, a very hot topic is pulmonary hypertension in pregnancy, which is actually one of the chapters in the book. Let's get started. So we have a 29-year-old healthy G1 P0 woman, 32 weeks of gestation, presents to the ER with shortness of breath. So what is our differential diagnosis in this female? Needless to say, it is broad. But what I want to teach you, you need a narrow differential to the big three. Number one, the heart. Number two, the lungs. Number three, the hemopoietic system. So let's talk about the heart. What are things that you should think about? The first thing is peripartum cardiomyopathy. That is horrible. Thank God it's rare. We don't see it as often. And it could happen up to six months after delivery. And how does it present? Just like heart failure. What flavor? Systolic heart failure. And we'll talk about that in a second. What about the lungs? What jumps to mind? Well, number one, you should think about asthma. And what a coincidence. Please catch my asthma video that I made on this website. You'll get some good tips and pearls. Just trust me on that. Next is going to be pneumonia. And why shouldn't people who are pregnant be exposed to the same things we are? So community acquired pneumonia. And don't forget the flu. And on that note, remember that even if you're pregnant, you should get the flu vaccine. You should. And then last will be a pulmonary embolism. And what would be the main risk factor of that? What hormone increases during pregnancy? Estrogen. And that's why one of the reasons why patients will be at risk. And when we talk about the hemopoietic system, the only bloodline I'm really consider, uh, worried about is the RBC, the red blood cell. Why? hemoglobin, delivering that oxygen to the tissues. And when you're pregnant, what happens to, why are patients more anemic? Dilution, because blood volume increases. And the placenta needs, oxygen, needs iron, so does the fetus. And that's why it's very easily to become iron deficient during pregnancy. So back to our patient. The patient reports an insidious onset of her shortness of breath that's progressed over the last four weeks. She admits to decreased exercise tolerance, a new onset of lower extremity edema. She has severe shortness of breath with ambulation. She has no past medical or surgical history. Her mother and father both have hypertension and she's taking her prenatal vitamins as instructed and no other meds. Five years prior, she did take an herbal supplement for weight loss. Let's see if that's a very important part of the history. Let's see. Uh, and she got these from Europe online. Um, otherwise, in review of systems, there is nothing. And look at this, beyond the pearls. Weight loss medications is huge in society, whether it's going to be here in the States or around the world. And one thing that you should be careful of is fenfen. Fenfen has been strongly associated with developing pulmonary hypertension. So let's see how that fits back into this patient. So let's talk about heart failure. That's going to be one of the main things. So heart failure has two main broad categories, systolic and diastolic. So when you have systolic dysfunction, congestive heart failure, it's a problem with contractility. Versus when you have diastolic heart failure, the main problem is relaxation of the ventricles. And if you can't relax the ventricles, you don't have any what? Preload. And preload's part of what? Stroke volume. Stroke volume is part of what? Cardiac output. And you can see where the problem is. So diastolic heart failure, think of my good friend, the Frank Starling curve and how no preload, no stroke volume. So how does heart failure present? So this is a great USMLE step two, step three clinical pearl. The key thing is look at number one tachycardia. Fast heart rate is horrible when you have CHF. Why? Is because you don't have any diastole. You want to slow down the heart rate so the ventricles can what? Fill. And that's why in anyone who has chronic heart failure, what is a drug that decreases mortality? 
beta blockers. We want to control that heart rate. You could have pulmonary rails. You could have a gallop. And what is a gallop? A gallop is going to be an extra heart sound like an S3 or an S4. An S3 will always be a sign of volume overload. It's a early diastolic heart sound versus an S4, which is a late diastolic heart sound from that atrial kick. You can get peripheral edema, JVP. Sometimes you can get what's called Sheen Stokes respiration, where you have that crescendo, decrescendo type breathing, especially when you're sleeping. And don't forget wheezing. Because remember, not everyone that wheezes has what? Asthma. Sometimes it can be a sign of CHF. So back to our patient on exam. She is a febrile. Her blood pressure is 103 over 54. Her respiratory rate is 22. Her heart rate is 92. And she's setting 93% on room air. She's in mild respiratory distress. She has obvious jugular venous distension. Think of that as kind of like a surrogate for a central venous pressure. And it's elevated, so probably a sign of volume overload. Her lungs are clear. Huh, and she has a loud P2. So what does P2 mean? Is that the pulmonic valve is closing later than the aortic valve. What can cause this? Many things, but also it could be pulmonary hypertension. Look at that murmur, a three out of six hollow, otherwise known as a pansystolic murmur. This can be seen with mitral regurgitation as well as tricuspid. And based upon the location, I'm thinking this is TR, tricuspid regurgitation. This is a setup for what? Pulmonary hypertension. She has some pitting edema and she's admitted to the obstructive floor for further evaluations. And guess who's consulted? The pulmonologist. So a chest x-ray is ordered because of shortness of breath. And look at this. The cardiac silhouette is enlarged. So this patient has a possible cardiomegaly because of the fact you want to confirm it with an echo and look at the hilum in both sides it's engorged it's full probably from enlarged pulmonary arteries we don't know for sure but that's how i'll interpret this chest x-ray so step one two three pearls right now what is pulmonary hypertension so look at the diagram below i think of it into three broad categories things that are pre-capillary what we call pulmonary arterial hypertension, things right at the level of the capillary, and things that are gonna be post-capillary, and we break that down into five groups, and you see what's called the WHO classifications. Group one is usually what we call the classic pulmonary arterial hypertension from familial, idiopathic, weight loss drugs, connective tissue diseases, things like scleroderma, who class two is going to be from the left side of the heart. Things happening in the pulmonary vein, heart failure. Group three is going to be people who have oxygenation problems like COPD, untreated obstructive sleep apnea. Class four is going to be thromboembolic diseases. And five is always going to be things that are kind of miscellaneous, things like sarcoidosis that can do it. And this is how we classify pulmonary hypertension. So. Let's talk about a step two, step three pearl. How do we make the diagnosis? Start off with an echo, a transthoracic echo. And then if you wanna confirm it, which you wanna do, you have to be invasive. What would I do next? I would get a swan gans catheter so I could actually confirm what the diagnosis is going to be. And when I do a swan gans, what am I going to do here is that I'm looking for a classic pattern. This pattern is going to be a mean arterial pressure of the pulmonary arteries to be elevated. I want the pulmonary vascular resistance to be elevated, cardiac output to be normal, and the pulmonary capillary wedge to be normal. And by definition, if it's pulmonary hypertension, the mean pulmonary artery pressures have to be greater than 25. So back to our patient. She does undergo a right-sided heart catheterization. The mean pulmonary artery pressure is elevated at 45. The wedge is normal. The cardiac output is normal. The PVR is elevated. This is classic for the diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And they do something called a vasodilator challenge. You give a medication to see if the, if the arteries are gonna dilate and drop that pressure. And it's important to do this because it changes your management. So based upon this and that medication, I didn't forget about it, Fenfen, she is diagnosed with WHO class one pulmonary arterial hypertension, secondary to 
the weight loss drug FenFen. Everyone, take a look at this slide. This is so important. One thing I'm very passionate about is to say that performing a swan gans catheter in a pregnant female should not be taken lightly. This is a risk just to do the procedure to the patient, to the fetus. It must be done in a case by case basis. And also the pearl on the bottom, vasoreactivity, like I said, if it's positive, it changes your management. Maybe you'll use calcium channel blockers to help these females. So in this case, what are our treatment options? This is gonna be a step one, two, and three pearl. The drug categories for pulmonary arterial hypertension are three main types. Things that affect endothelium, which is a very potent vasoconstrictor, so you wanna block it. Prostacyclin analogs, because those are gonna be very potent vasodilators, and the nitric oxide system. And on the right, when I show you this very, this diagram of many things you can do, when someone comes in with pulmonary hypertension, regardless of etiology, some things that may help them out will be giving diuresis. And not everyone needs anticoagulation, only certain ones do, secondary to chronic thromboembolic disease, maybe who class one, but remember, no Coumadin when we talk about pregnancy. Maybe these patients need to be on a heparin product. And back to our patient. She is uh, diagnosed with pulmonary arterial hypertension, WHO class one, New York heart failure class three. And what does that mean? Look at the diagram. Based upon her symptoms, this New York heart classification is not based on ejection fraction, but how severe her symptoms are. So she is class three. And based upon this, our recommendations is IV therapy. So we begin her on IV therapy. She's anxious to see what's gonna happen during her pregnancy. But before we go into that, what are some of the cardiovascular changes with pregnancy? So number one, remember, the fetus needs more oxygen. So how are we gonna do that? Increase oxygen delivery. How do we do that? To increase cardiac output, two things are gonna happen. Because of the increased volume, you're gonna have more preload that increases stroke volume that will increase the cardiac output but also we decrease the afterload. How do we do that? Look at that picture. Classic step one question. The placenta is connected in parallel. When something's in parallel, it decreases sy systemic vascular resistance, decreasing the what? Afterload. And also because estrogen is increasing during pregnancy, estrogen itself is a very, very potent vasodilator. So those are things that happen to help uh, deliver that oxygen uh, to the baby. But when you have pulmonary arterial hypertension, what happens? The right ventricle starts failing. And because of this, no blood flow can go to the left side of the heart, cardiac output drops. Sometimes the, left ven the right ventricle will push the septum right into the left ventricle. And now the left ventricle has no what? Preload, because they can't relax during diastole, dropping the cardiac output even further. And all the pressure will back up, leading to JVP, liver engorgement, lower extremity edema, all the signs we see with right-sided heart failure. So how does pregnancy impact pH? Well, let me just say this, is that if you're a female with known pulmonary arterial hypertension, Oh, we advise you not to get pregnant, unfortunately. You have to be on dual anti-conception if possible. And if you do become pregnant, it's gonna be a multidisciplinary approach. We need to sit down with the pulmonologist, the critical care doctor, the, uh, the ob -GYN doctor, and there are no consensus about what time to deliver. So back to our patient, she shows a great response to IV epiprostenol. And after a multidisciplinary meeting, it was decided that we will do follow-up weekly in an outpatient clinic. She proceeds to have an elective C-section at 34 weeks gestation. She undergoes an uncomplicated delivery and is monitored in the medical ICU to follow up at the pulmonary hypertension clinic uh, thereafter. So let's go beyond the pearls. The key teaching point is patients who have pulmonary arterial hypertension, they don't tolerate big shifts in volume status. If you give them too much diuresis, uh-oh, cardiac output would drop. If you give them too much volume, uh-oh, cardiac output would drop. So you need to do things 
very, very conservatively. Go slow and go low. And in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, some in 4C do need to get referred to a transplant hospital. And last but not least, like in our patient, she received IV prostacycline analog called epiprostanol. It does have side effects they love for step one, such as diarrhea, jaw pain, flushing, and headaches. But fortunately, many of these symptoms will minimize over time. I hope you enjoyed talking about pulmonary arterial hypertension and pregnancy. Please check out my book series, look at our medicine book, Surgery Peeps, and of course, OB-GYN Morning Report, Beyond the Pearls.